the system, because um, even between different distributions it varies quite a lot. So what I'm going to try and do is give you a bit of an overview of what it's about, why we're going to use it, um, and then a rough idea of how to start setting up on your system. So what is LGAP? Um, originally, uh, somebody came up with a great idea of storing information in a directory, um, and that was called X500, and they used a protocol called DAP, Directory Access Protocol, in order to access that information. Unfortunately, that was quite a heavyweight piece of kit. Um, it ran reasonably slowly and wasn't particularly good um, over WAN links and things like that. And as people realised that was how they were going to use LDAP, they thought, oh sorry, um, use directories, and they thought LDAP would be a good solution to that. Um, if you're particularly bored, you can go and have a look at RFC 1777, uh, and I'll tell you a specification for LDAP. Uh, it is reasonably boring, I wouldn't recommend it unless you're particularly interested. Um, so LDAP, um, same as uh, X500, is basically a tree-based structure, so you've got a root of the tree, and branches coming off of that, uh, and that's how you store your information. I'll show you in a moment roughly what that looks like. Um, LDAP isn't a database as such, although the back ends are generally called databases, it is a directory. And one of the things that means is that it's been optimised for reading. So we want to use LDAP in places where you're going to do lots of reads from the directory, but you're not going to make a lot of changes. There are ways to optimise it, so writing is a bit quicker, but generally you want to use it in heavy read situations. So as I've put here, things like address books, you don't change your address very often, but you quite often look up an address. Authentication, don't change the password very often, or maybe not too often, um, but you look up credentials quite a lot. And uh, even on small networks, some people use it instead of DNS, you can actually do host lookups via LDAP as well. So that's roughly what a directory looks like in theory. Obviously it's not stored like that. So it's stored in various different types of back-end, um, like databases, things like that. Um, at the top there you've got your root node. Um, DC, as you can see on a couple of those, stands for Domain Component. Each of those effectively is a domain name, which is how you work your way down the tree. So uh, you can call things OU for people here, stands for Organisational Unit. It doesn't actually matter what you specify as such. Um, that's basically to give you a better idea of what information you're storing and how you're doing it. So your site, for example, if you're doing it for a company, might have a web address just to help you um, represent the data. So example.com, I don't know if it exists, I won't go and have a look, but um, you'd work your way down there and then you'd say, right, I want to look for people. So you move to the organisational unit, people. Under that, we've got our users stored. If we go the other way, we've got our groups. So it's just a way of grouping information. So why would you want to use this for authentication? Why is it a good idea? Well, the one thing it really gives you is centralised account management. Um, even if you've got a couple of PCs at home, maybe a couple of users, you might have three or four different accounts on three or four different boxes. Um, that can be a bit of a pain to admin. Um, you've got different passwords on different boxes potentially, or you've got to make sure they're always the same on the different boxes. You've got different home directories, different password settings, things like that. So what we can do is we can put them in one place in an LDAP directory, and we can manage everything from there. So, consolidation of usernames and passwords, you can have one account that will let you log on to any box. Same password, doesn't matter which box it is, uh, you can log on with the same credentials. When you change your password, it gets updated in the directory, and whichever box you log on to, the password has been updated. That, from a point of view of a company, for example, means reduced administration time. If you've got a lot of boxes and a lot of users, then it's going to take a long time to go around and make sure that everything's set up. Same on boxes, password policies, and so on. Um, if somebody says, I've forgotten my password, which is annoyingly common, um, all you need to do is log on to your LDAP directory and update the password for them. You don't have to worry about which box you're on. Improved security. That's maybe not so obvious looking at what we're using LDAP for. But if you have a separate account for every user on every box, rather than, say, a login for a group of people, you can do better auditing and better tracking of people that are logging in, they're viewing to root, things like that. Um, so that's probably more useful from a corporate point of view, not necessarily so much at home. Interoperability, like using big long words. Um, things like you have quite a good example. Um, say, for example, you have a website that you want to protect um, using, for example, HTTP authentication, something like that. Well, wouldn't it be useful if you had a user account on the box, but you could also get to the website and use that same username and password to get onto your intranet or whatever it is you're using it for? Well, Apache's got a plugin which will let you talk to LDAP and query the credentials in the database, or the directory, sorry, um, and you can use that same username and password to log in there. Um, again, that's really useful when you've got large numbers of users to be cutting down the different sets of credentials um, and also helping people uh, by giving them only one username and password. 
So how are we going to set up uh, LDAP to do some form of authentication? Well, you need an LDAP server. That's going to hold your directory. Um, it can be with shared files, um, sorry, it can be with uh, remote files. You can have an NFS share with your LDAP information on, um, which is often quite useful for backing data up. So for example, you can have two LDAP servers, uh, both of which use um, the same NFS server, and then you can just back up the NFS server, so you've got all your information backed up. Um, on each client, we're going to need to say, you're going to use your LDAP directory for authentication. We've got to say somehow, instead of looking at files on disk, I want you to go away, have a look in the LDAP directory, and get your information from there. Uh, on Debian, it's called pamldap.sa. I think the name does vary depending on which distribution you're using, but essentially that's how it's going to work. Uh, for those of you that don't know, PAM is um, pluggable authentication modules. Uh, very nifty system in Linux for using um, different authentication methods. All you need is a plugin for PAM, and it doesn't matter what your application is, it goes to PAM and says, I need to verify this user's credentials are correct. PAM then looks at the list of ways it can get credentials, and you can set it up to check different ones in different orders and so on. So you have effectively a transparent authentication method. An FTP server, for example, just says to PAM, is this correct? PAM goes off, queries LDAP, comes back, says, yes, this user can log in, or no, access is denied. So what information do we want to put in our LDAP directory? Well, the basic information you need to put in just for authentication is from these three files. Password, as hopefully quite a lot of you know, where the user information is stored, things like password expiry, maybe last change of password. Um, one important thing that it emits, hopefully on most systems, is your password. That's stored in a slightly more secure file, etc. shadow, which effectively mirrors the password while it's storing um, the password separately. Uh, it's not stored in plain text, it's normally in crypt or something similar, um, MD5, it does vary from system to system. Finally, we've got etc. group, which is storing your group name, your group IDs, and also who's a member of which group. So that way we can put all the information into LDAP, and we only have to store limited information on each box. So if we want to add information to an LDAP directory, we're going to do it in text form, and they use a format called LDIF. Uh, you can see here I've got a list of all the different attributes that this entry has got. And you start at the top with your domain name. So we've got our domain components. First of all, our website, netviz.co.uk, so I've structured it like that. UK, go, netviz, and then you split off into things like groups, people, um, as we've got here. So we're in the organisational unit, people. My user ID is blue Browning. don't ask. <laughs> so we repeat. The very first, or the very last component of the domain name there, um, because this is actually the attribute um, that we're adding in. And then I've got all the separate attributes under that which I want to store. So my real name, what sort of item this is, it's Posit's account, i.e. we can log in using it. Um, that's what the um, PAM module is going to look for to authenticate against. Um, I've unfortunately removed my encrypted password, so you can't write it down. Um, last change, when did I last change my password? Um, I'm time ago, um, login shells and things like that. And it's also got my user ID number as well. Um, one thing that's worth bearing in mind if you're moving from a system that's got existing users into LDAP is that you don't duplicate these user ID numbers, otherwise you get into big trouble. A good way of doing it is to remove the information from etc. password and so on, so you don't have any local users, uh, and then add people back into the directory or into the directory to begin with, with the same user IDs. Uh, and finally, I've got my home directory, and I'll talk about why you might want to change that in a minute. Right, resilience. Well, let's say, um, again, more from a, a corporate point of view, I suppose, um, but you've got quite a few boxes, probably servers, um, and if authentication goes down, you can't log into the box. A bit of a pain. So what we're going to do is run more than one LDAP server. Uh, when you're setting up LDAP, in Linux in particular, other operating systems, um, BSD, AIX, for example, support it, you list multiple servers. What it will do is try and authenticate against the first server. If it can't find that, it will move on to the second one, and so on. Um, normally, there's some form of connection affinity between the different servers, so once the server um, is found that works, that box will stay using that authentication server until it finds that it fails. But in order to keep all the information the same, so that whichever server it uses, you've got the same credentials in, we then need to use replication. That's how we send the differences between the servers to make sure that they're all up to date. You can use it in different ways. You can have peer-to-peer, -peer, where effectively all servers act as masters, um, and can make changes to themselves, and then replicate that change outwards. 
or we can use master-slave replication, uh, where you've got one designated master server and several slave servers underneath that. If you use a slave server and make a change, that goes back to the master server and says, I'd like to make this update, please. The master then propagates that change out to all the slave servers underneath it. So, as I said there, clients are configured to use any available server. So that way, if one server goes down, your system's going to keep running, you can still log in, um, and particularly in corporate environments, that's really, really important. So, configuring your client. Uh, it's not particularly difficult to do. Um, with PAM, all that I need to do on my system, for example, is install lib PAM LDAP, um, and that gave me the module I mentioned earlier on. So, I've gone into uh, my PAM.d directory, had a look, uh, again, it does depend on the distribution, I'm afraid. Debian uses common auth, common account, uh, and common password. And all you need to do is edit those three files. And it makes a change for all the different um, sorts of authentication, FTP, uh, Apache, things like that. Um, and we're going to add those three lines in. Normally, people have an auth required PAM Unix, which says you can't log in unless you've uh, got an account somewhere um, in the files stored on the box. But if we change it like this, so we say it doesn't matter. You can either have an account locally on the box, or you can have one in LDAP. Either way, you can log into the box. Set that for all three, so that uh, you have to have a full set of information before a user can log in. Uh, nothing requires restarting. PAM reads the files whenever you log in. Uh, so that's all you need to do. I'll even to demonstrate in a minute. Right, I said earlier on that you might want to change uh, your home directory. Why would you want to do that? Well, NFS home directories are a really, really nifty idea. If you run an NFS server and you put everyone's home directories on that, you can set it up so that when you log into a box with your uh, authentication details from the LDAP directory, it reads the home directory name and says, uh, your home directory is home NFS, your username. And you set that up to be an NFS mount. You can then control that with auto mount so that when you log in as your LDAP user, it says, right, that's my home directory, tries to change into it. Auto man goes, ah, we need to mount this, goes to the NFS server, mounts up your home directory, and hey presto, all your files appear on the box. So that means whichever box you go to, or you can log into multiple boxes at once, you've got the same directory, uh, same home directory wherever you go. Um, the more users you get, the more useful that becomes. It means you don't get duplication of files between boxes, helps people move files around, save a file to your home directory, it reappears effectively on another box. And also you can do things similar to <coughs> Microsoft roaming profiles, uh, where normally per user settings are stored in your home directory, in your dot directory. Um, so when you mount your home directory or login, automatically you've got all your settings for your CD burners or your music applications, whatever it is, um, that will effectively appear on that box. Uh, and again, that's something really nice you can do with LDAP. Um, you don't have to use LDAP to do it, obviously, but it's certainly a good way of combining the two together to give you a more complete solution. And also, the last point, again, um, more useful for companies, but also at home, is that if you've got NFS exports that you're using for home directories, generally it's stored all on one server. So you don't have to worry about backing up each machine. All you have to do is back up the NFS server. Useful places you might want to go and have a look for more information. Um, in order to get the information out of the files stored on your boxes and into LDAP, you want to have a look at the migration tools. Um, these guys have written just a couple of Perl scripts. I don't know in Perl, but not to worry. We'll drag the information out of the files and create an LDAP for you, like I showed you earlier on, um, which you can import straight into your LDAP directory. How to set things up? Uh, it's a bit of a generic how-to. It does change from distribution to distribution, but um, that's quite useful to have a look at. And finally, if you're looking at doing um, some kind of replication, a, a more highly available solution, um, then it's worth having a look at. Yeah. Uh, leave those up in case anybody wants to have a look. Um, and they'll also be on the Hansberg or Wiki shortly. Any questions? No, no, I'm not. How hard is it to make Windows authenticate against the Linux side website? I don't know specifically going that direction, but going the other way is significantly easier because you can use Active Directory to authenticate in Linux. With We're the right. the other way around. Don't think you can. I've not seen it done. Huh? And it reasonably should. I've seen it done. But I don't know how it is. You can certainly do it if you just want um, things like being able to log on. You can do an NT4 PDC with Samba. And Samba can use an LDAP backend. 
Um, that way it's fairly easy, but you can't actually do it directly against, or you can't have an active directory. So how is that domain control? Well, it's yeah. Sample, but, uh, yeah. As long as you're prepared to put up with an MD4, primary domain control. What is it about or a Windows 2000 box? MD4, primary domain control is the way Anyone else? Just an observation. Mm -hmm. um, you said you didn't know, for example, what comic this is. It does. It does. It's reserved, um, but it's reserved for use in there you go. Well, that's obviously why I picked it. Anyone else? Okay, thank you very much.